You know, there are people within Christendom that they say, well, you know, to be a Christian, you've got to believe in Christ, and you've got you to do good works, and you've got to work, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that. No, you don't. If you want to negate the promise that is given to each person for their simple faith and trust in Christ, if you want to negate it, yeah, go back and start keeping the Sabbath. We've been using Colossians 2, um, 2, 16 and 17, but really 2, 16 has been the text. Let no man therefore judge you in eating, drinking, or in respect of a holiday new moon or of the Sabbath days. And last week, I tried to kind of give a thumbnail sketch regarding a little bit of the reckoning of time. Um, probably last week, if you left here, you left here and your brain felt like a traffic jam on the 405 because I dumped enough stuff on you. That's what I do. Um, but the idea was to kind of point out that there are a lot of variables when we're trying to, specifically we're talking about the Sabbath, how to understand the Sabbath and how should Christians understand the Sabbath. So my goal today is to kind of do, slow down a little bit. I'm hoping this will only be one message, but it might take two to do this, so bear with me. Um, this being message number 17 in the second chapter of the book of Colossians, but we're not even going to be in the book of Colossians, if you can imagine that. So in the book of Genesis, which is kind of where we start, and yes, it'll be a very brief review. I'm not wanting to go over everything I said last week, but briefly in the book of Genesis in the first and beginning of second, but specifically the first chapter, we read that God created, he spoke, and out of nothing, everything was. The days of creation are itemized with each day's activity being stated, so that by the sixth day we see God putting the capstone on his creative work by making Adam, let us make Adam in our image. Now, there's an, this one little thing I'm saying here will be important either for later in this message or possibly for next week. And the reason why I, I highlight this is when God said, let us make your, your King James reads man. That would be um, the 26th verse of the first chapter. Let us make man in our image. But we've looked at this many times. The Hebrew has multiple words. For man, if it's just generically referring to man, we have actually two other words, but the most common one is ish or ishi. And here, it's very specific. Let us make Adam, Adam, okay? This will become important in something else I will say either later today or in next week's message. So just hold that thought, try and remember it. So the seventh day in the book of Genesis is designated a day of rest, a day of commemorating all that God did bring forth in his creation. And if you and I read what happens on the seventh day, you get to chapter 2, and chapter 2 begins with, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his works which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now I want you to stop and pretend, please, for just a millisecond. You never read this before. It's the first time you're reading this. The whole of creation has already happened. Everything in creation has already been brought forth, including the creation of Adam, and Eve. Now what's important here, and this is an important thought process to follow, is that this day of rest is essentially declared. And go back and read carefully. God ended, I'm going to emphasize, so if I, forgive me, it might sound a little wacky. God, it says God ended his work, that's my emphasis, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. There is no instruction right here to Adam. We don't read. If there is, it's not recorded for us. Only that God declared he, God, was resting from all his work which he hath wrought. Now, why do I point this out? 
because from Adam and Adam's hearing, Adam was created on the sixth day, God declared the seventh day arrest, which means that between the sixth and the seventh day is a period, we'll call it 24 hours for lack of knowing exactly what that period could have been, whatever it was, a, a million hours, I don't know. But in that time frame, which is called the first day, whatever that is, we have Adam being finished or created on the sixth day. So that means that on the seventh day, when God declared this arrest, the ears of them that were created had to have heard that this was the Lord's day of rest. But yet, there is absolutely no instruction to Adam. There is no instruction to the descendants of Adam. And the first time we encounter the word Sabbath will be in Exodus 16, and I believe verse 23. That's the first time, which means there are several hundreds of years from Adam to Exodus, to the point I'm talking about, um, several hundreds of years that have passed. And then all of a sudden we have, we'll call it a reintroduction. The children of Israel had probably not been out of Egypt for more than approximately 30 days when we get to chapter 16. I'm giving you approximations. Uh, why? Because we know on what day. Remember, they left Egypt during the Passover, and this chapter starts with the fact that chapter 16, they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. So we know the approximate timeline, how long it took them to get there. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The children of Israel said unto them, would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth unto this wilderness to kill us this whole assembly with hunger. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather at a certain rate every day. Here's where it gets important, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Now, some of you have not been around a long time, so you won't have understood or gotten the teaching on the word prove. But this word I did an extensive teaching on, which essentially is God saying, I want to see what's in your heart. So when it says God did prove, it's the same word being used in Genesis 22 when it says God did tempt Abraham to see what was in his heart. What he, would he obey? Would he listen or would he do his own things? It's the same word being used. So it says here, I will rain bread down from heaven that the people shall go out and gather at a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in. It shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel at even, then shall ye know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning, then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Moses spake unto Aaron, uh, Moses, and Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. It came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay around about the host, the manna that fell, when the dew, or what, what had fallen, when the dew that lay was gone, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, it is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, this is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, 
an omer for every man according to the number of your persons, take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. I got to read the whole thing for you to get the picture. Lots of reading here. And when they did meet it with an omer, they gathered much, had nothing over, but he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. Moses said, let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, not a surprise, but some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. They gathered it every morning, and every man according to his eating, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted. It came to pass that on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. He said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and see that which ye will see, and that which ye remaineth over, lay up for you over, that be kept until the morning. And they laid up until the morning, as Moses bade. And it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. It came to pass that they went out, some, some of the people, on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. This is what is interesting. God tells them, this is what's going to happen. Some of these nuts have to go out there and see for themselves, right? And that still continues today. You tell people a certain thing, and you warn them, and they still got to do it for themselves, make their own decision. The Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, that, see for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath. Therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And you could keep reading on. But the point I want to make here is what happens. Moses clearly is giving the orders to the people. And something interesting is said here. First and, first and foremost, when the Lord speaks and he says, I'll rain bread from heaven, and the people go and gather, arrayed every, every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Don't you think it's strange that God has not yet given the law? The law will be given in chapter 20. Don't you think it's strange, though, that the first place where the people will be tested as to their obedience isn't in thou shall not kill, isn't in thou shall not worship any other gods before me, it isn't honor thy mother and thy father, but it is the Sabbath. That's the first place God started. And if you think about it, the Sabbath is just a day of rest. These stiff-necked people could not even comprehend that God was giving them rest from their labors. But there's something more. When you kind of start peeling this back, you have to ask the question. Man was created on the sixth day. God rested on the seventh. Why is it that, forgive me for saying it like this, but obviously God ordained it this way, but why should we be so conceited as to think that we would share the same rest as God, even though God said, this is my day and I'm, I'm resting from my work? Here we will begin to see a shift in the purpose of the Sabbath. See, the Sabbath originally, Sabbath in the Hebrew, and all of its cognates have or point to seven Sabbath rest cessation. Those are the concepts around the Hebrew word. I find it remarkable, though, that even here in this passage, there is something to say for 430 years of bondage where people may have forgotten, but you notice the only instruction that is given is go out there and collect twice as much on the sixth day because on the seventh you won't collect. And of course, you've got a couple of people who are like, oh, we're going to go out on the seventh day anyway, right? But it's as though, even though the law had not been given, God already had his law in his mind, in his heart. He didn't just on the spot say, well, I'm going to start with making up a law right now, right? This was already... Uh, in God's heart, in God's mind, because the institution of this day happened in creation, but the application of the day is going to morph. 
And as you go through the Bible, you will see how it morphs. So in this great debate, and it may not be so great for you, but I, everywhere I turn, I hear people always discussing this. We can actually settle the matter and better understand why, uh, how we should understand the Sabbath and how we should be essentially approaching this whole subject. So what I just showed you first and foremost, there are several points here that I'd like to reiterate. Um, the first thing is God was proving the people, testing the people. Now you might say, well, that's not very fair. Well, he did it to Abraham. I just mentioned that in Genesis 22. So it's kind of interesting when you see God is trying to say, I want to know what's in here. And the law had not yet been given, but he says, I'm going to test it out with this first one pertaining to the Sabbath. And will they follow my precepts? Now, here's what is greatly frustrating. God does all of this, okay? And um, if, if I want to kind of add on to this, there's so much symbolism in what he will do after the second tables of stone are made. We know that they're placed within the ark, if you remember. What's placed in the ark? The tables of unbroken stone, a pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded overnight. We have examples, if you will, of what I picture the ark, if you will, as the heart of God, uh, the sprinkling that goes on the mercy seat as a type of uh, atonement, the covering, the caporeth, and what's inside. And even there in, in shadow and type, we have to recognize that God was putting the shadow and type by putting these things inside the ark and requiring the ark to be sprinkled with blood. These things, even these things were being cleansed, if you will, even they, they pertain to God as essentially belonging to that which was the people, being given to the people, placed in the ark, and now the ark is, for us, for all intents and purposes, gone. But you know what's interesting? When God was giving the instructions to Moses on the mount, and he said, see to it that you build everything that I tell you, exactly, exactly. Do not mess one measurement up. Why? Because essentially what you're building here on earth, there is the exact, but the reality of what is the shadow in heaven. That also means the ark. Settle that one for a minute because the tables of stone, the pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, it's all there. Now, if you think that Moses records all of this and he says, yeah, there were some, some fools went out there and started to gather, you get a better picture from, for example, I'm going back and forth. You get a better picture from somebody like Ezekiel. I'll read to you what Ezekiel says. He's speaking as though the Lord is speaking through him. And Ezekiel, prophet of the exile period, moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifieth them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes. They despised my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them and my Sabbaths they greatly polluted. Then I said I would pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. But I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen in whose sight I, am brought, I brought them out. Yet also I lifted up my hand unto them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands, because they despised my judgments, walked not in my statutes, but polluted my Sabbaths for their heart went after their idols. Nevertheless, mine eyes spared them from destroying them, neither did I make an end of them in the wilderness. But I said unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your father, neither observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my judgments, and do them. Hollow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So even Ezekiel, that was Ezekiel 20, by the way, even Ezekiel, hundreds of years later, was chronicling what these people had done. And it's not just the mouth of Ezekiel, by the way, you've got many people. Hosea laments the same thing. In fact, almost every prophet will lament the same thing. 
over and over and over again. The call from the prophets was always the same. Repent, it's not too late to turn back to God, but no. All right, so now, what, what, what can we know? And there's plenty that we can know here. Um, I'm going to give you some bullet points as I put them out and see if we can make some sense of this. So first bullet point. Um, there is a contrast between the Sabbath of the Lord and the Sabbath of the children of Israel. I'm going to start to point this out. So the one that's instituted at the close of the first week in, of time, while the other is ordained in connection with feasts. You've got to go to Leviticus 23, which we will shortly to point that out. One was blessed and hallowed by God because that he rested upon it from the work of creation. The others, that is mankind, has no claim on anything God did. God simply says, it's my day to rest. I determine what you all are going to do. But very important, in the Decalogue, when he says of thy work, thy work, and remember that, I'm emphasizing thy work, all the work you've done, six days, you've got to do thy work. And the thy is there for a reason. It's everything that you need to do as part of the curse, by the way, that was placed upon Adam. Adam must earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. So now we have kind of a connecting concept. The children of Israel could not very well claim that they, although they labored in Egypt for 430 years, they could not claim that they had anything to do with the labor of creation. So if you think about it, the fact that they wouldn't even keep his Sabbath, even though basically he made it for them. He designed this first as a commemoration of his work, and then later he passes it on to them. A bird's eye view. Exodus 16, he gives them the Sabbath and the manna. Exodus 19, he gives them himself. Exodus 20, he gives them the law. So you can kind of see God is not pointing the finger and thou and thou and thou. And in fact, when you read, even in the Decalogue, you read very carefully, it starts with one key word, remember. Not thou shall not. Remember. Remember the Sabbath. Be mindful of it. Now, the Sabbath of the Lord was made to give rest or cessation from work, but annual Sabbaths were designed only for those entering into the Promised Land. I'm talking about those who actually were brought out of Egypt's bondage. You have many references to uh, the Sabbath being the Sabbath of the Lord, my Sabbath, my holy day, but you also have other references as you traverse the Bible that become yours, you and yours, because God is going to, you're going to see a shift. God is going to, at some point, basically be done. And he is. He gets done with these people. And the reason why I point that out is because um, the mention, for example, of Sabbaths, as I said, creation. The next one is in Exodus and then you've got to make a big leap to the next time the Sabbath is even brought up again. And that would be in mentions of possibly of David's life. Remember when David was going to beg bread and he went in and it had to be the Sabbath day because they had just replaced the showbread. But other than that, you don't have a great number of um, things that are putting the Sabbath in your face. So why I'm telling you that this all becomes very important. It, it's very clear to me that, for example, from Exodus, you go into Leviticus and you get a, a good understanding of how the feasts and how everything's laid out. If you go to Exodus, I mean Leviticus 20, uh, 23, and um, Levit Leviticus 23 begins with talking about all the feasts. Um, speak unto the children of Israel, saying unto them, concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, 
a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is a Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the feasts of the Lord. And you've got three feast pilgrimage feasts that would have, they would have Sabbaths inside of them apart from the regular weekly occurring Sabbath. And why do I say that? Because it says these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. So if I put this in plain English, it would kind of look like this. First day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a feast at the end of that. In other words, it'd be bookends. The first, the end, the first, the end, and then the 15th, the 22nd, the 29th of the month. So you'd have more than just the weekly occurring Sabbaths within those holidays. If I look back at the Exodus episode, you know what's remarkable? Um, there was no precepts given to the people in the Exodus event I just mentioned regarding the Sabbath's observance until the Sabbath was violated. Don't you think on that? There were no instructions given other than go collect twice as much for that day until it was violated. And then it was made known that the people had violated it. So what does that tell me? That tells me that somewhere there is a vestigial remnant of oral tradition where they would have known, or at least heard of, at least in trace memory of some form of a Sabbath for which in our records from Genesis clear through, uh, we'll call it the Pentateuch, we, we have this kind of chronicling and then all of a sudden a, a, a petering off. It just kind of almost disappears. It's almost like, here's this big push for the Decalogue in Exodus. Then you move into the book of Joshua, which is basically the continuation of the people entering into the land, the few that did. And if you remember in this uh, Joshua, we have the story of them walking around Jericho and the walls come tumbling down, right? Even young children know the story. What's fascinating about the story is now, here we could maybe say, prior to the Exodus, the people may have only had oral tradition and vestigial remnant knowledge of the Sabbath. Here, they had just been given within, we'll call it a reasonable amount of time, they had just been given the instructions of the law, and it was reiterated to them. Now, Joshua and his band have entered into the land and I want to read to you because it, 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 there, there's no mention of Sabbath here, but there is something very evident and I'd like to point it out. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. The Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all, of, all ye men of war, go round about the city once, Thou shalt do six days. So for six days, you're going to walk around the city. Seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. The seventh day, you shall compass about the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests, said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant. Let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns. You know the story, and they walk, and they go round and round and round and round. There is no mention of a Sabbath, yet we encounter a full week, six days, and on the seventh day, they're going to blow the horns, and the walls are going to fall down. And this is what I was trying to point out. The law says, you'll finish your work, thy work in six days. This was the Lord's work. See, the Lord is the Lord. The Lord's the Lord of the Sabbath. In fact, you go into the New Testament and you counter Jesus, you counter Jesus after he's been criticized by the Pharisees saying, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So God can do what he wants concerning his work. He doesn't have to justify. He doesn't have to explain. So very easily, I can see it as plain as day, even though there is no Sabbath counting here. It doesn't say that they celebrated or they did anything. And yet we have a chronicle of a full week of the full event. No Sabbath is mentioned. But I'm going to tell you, see what I see plainly in plain view, 
is that when it says about how you know, they did it and on the seventh day and everything came crashing down, it seems pretty clear to me that they did all this on the Sabbath. But it was the Lord that basically sent them. So they weren't breaking, they weren't violating the Sabbath. Now you will not encounter another one of these, um, we'll call it um, alluding to a Sabbath um, until you get to, as I mentioned, the life of David, where you see David's on the lamb and David's running for his life and he's hungry and he's scared and he goes where the priests are and he knows that there's gonna be bread there, he's hungry. And he goes begging for bread, and the, the, the priest says, I have no common bread here. But he knew the procedure and the law. The law was to replace the showbread, those loaves that were baked and offering from the people to God, baked and presented every Sabbath. So the old bread was taken away. This is what David begged for, essentially, the, the old bread that would have been simply taken away. So we have David on the Sabbath begging for bread. And yet there isn't really a mention like God saying this is greatly frowned upon or David would be punished. Why? What is the consequence for doing any work on the Sabbath? Death. You serious? Yeah, God's serious about his rest. He said, when I say rest, you better rest. So um, you kind of see a little bit of a morphing of things. As we get closer and further towards, into the new, towards the New Testament, you begin to see that even the prophets are very frustrated with the way people have treated God's precepts. So even Nehemiah, Nehemiah is speaking in this great passage and he says, Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, Spake with them from heaven, gave us them right judgments, true laws, good statutes, and commandments, made us known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and commandest them that them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant. Thou gavest them bread from heaven for their hunger, and broughtest them forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst, and promised them that they should go in to possess the land which thou hast sworn to give them. But they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their their necks and hearken not to thy commandments and refuse to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks in their rebellion, appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and out of great kindness forsook them not. So even out of the mouth of Nehemiah, he's saying like, you guys are a bunch of jerks. First book of Scott right there, okay? So you can, we can see um, a little bit of what happens. Now, if you really want to kind of make this a little bit more interesting, you pass through passages like what Isaiah says, and I'll read it to you. Um, there are a couple of passages, for example, Isaiah 58 and verse 13. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. So it seems like the Sabbath was greatly important, but throughout time we see there is just this stop and a, a, a true lack on the part of people to keep it. So what happens now? And this is what gets interesting. As we move into the New Testament, and this gets, this, this is kind of the fun part for me. What we can see plainly is that in all the examples within the Gospels, save the references that are made at the end of each gospel where it says at the first day of the week, which is the same Greek word for Sabbath, save those references. Most of the references have to do with Jesus healing on the Sabbath, with Jesus performing his works on the Sabbath and the criticism that he took 
from the religious people of his day. So, for example, in Matthew 12, Matthew 12, and I'll give you an example of this. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. I have to stop right there and tell you, that's not true. That's absolutely, unequivocally not true. And unless you know what the law says, you think that what the Pharisees were saying was true, that they were breaking the law. But they weren't breaking the law. The law actually provides if you are hungry. There are, there are graceful, merciful provisions in the law if your animal's stuck in a ditch, you can pull it out. If you're starving and you have no food, you may eat. So Pharisees, being the blunt-minded thinkers that they were, they're thinking they're plucking the corn. See, the, in, in the provision, the law spells out you're not allowed to pluck for harvest. You're not allowed to do anything for harvest purposes. However, if you were starving, you could go and eat. So obviously, even by their own testimony, these people don't even know their own law. And I wanted to, <laughs> yes, that's what I wanted to say, exactly. All right. But he said unto them, have you not read what David did? Which is what I just mentioned. When he was a hungered, that, and they, they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God, did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that, that in this place is one greater than the temple, and had you known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Hold that thought right there, because Mark adds one delicious line to this whole uh, situation. At the end of Mark 2.27, he says, Jesus says, kind of culminating in the same exchange, he says, the Sabbath was made for man and man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. Now, if you go back where I was in Matthew, beginning chapter 12, beginning at the ninth verse. All these have to do with Sabbath and synagogue. And he was departed thence, went into their synagogue. Again, I want you to notice small words, their synagogue. It doesn't say his synagogue, it says their synagogue, specifically referencing the fact, a synagogue, Jewish. Okay. Behold, there was a man which his hand was withered, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days, that they might accuse him, always looking to set him up and trip him up and get an aha, gotcha moment, right? He said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, that if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, he will not lay hold on it to lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore is, is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. And then the Pharisees went out and held counsel against him how they might destroy him. So a couple of things I want you to know, and you can do more reading in your own time, but you'll see many times over that Jesus is either going into the Sabbath to read and to teach, or he's healing you have the man that laid at the pool of Siloam, 38 years in infirmity. When, what day was that? Sabbath day. So it's almost as though when Jesus says, Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, he was putting on display a couple of things. There are a couple of things being revealed here. That Jesus is merciful. Jesus was never a legalist. Remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was facing God, and the Word was part of creating the law. But Jesus is merciful. Jesus doesn't say, well, you know, if you're sick, you better stay sick until Monday morning. <laughs> so what I can see even here, there is no violation. How they accused him of violating. Well, they accused Jesus of a lot of things. 
but if he's Lord of the Sabbath, he can do whatever he wants. But I want you to notice all of the works that he did that he worked on the Sabbath day were all essentially his works that would bring glory. And they were works to bring praise and they were works to show the goodness of God. And yet these people, which are the same people today in today's society that will stand and do exactly what Paul says, let no man judge you in respect of eating, drinking, holy days, Sabbaths. If you celebrate the Sabbath on the Saturday, knock yourself out. If you do it on Sunday, knock yourself out. I don't really care, but here's the important thing. The term Sabbath, seven, rest, cessation. And so people then start to think, well, is Sunday the Sabbath for the Christians? And I have an answer to that. And I'll answer you in just a few minutes because you'll find out that as you progress through all of Jesus' healing, Jesus' working miracles, there is nothing there. If you go back and you read the law, there is nothing there that he violates. Moreover, remember I said to you, once you get into the book of Acts and you have here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You have ten references in the book of Acts to the word Sabbath. One of them is referring to the first day of the week. And um, a couple of them are referring to a Sabbath day journey from somewhere. And the rest of them in the book of Acts are referring to when Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and whoever went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and reasoned amongst the people. He taught, he, was, he went in. Paul was really smart, you know. If you want to reach the people who you know, if you explain it to them that Messiah has already come, Start with the people who already believe in the one true living God. It's pretty smart. So he goes in on the Sabbath and he talks to these people and he's telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ. What I glean from this is that, as I said, 1 Corinthians 16, 2, the mention there is not to a Sabbath. The mention there is to a collection. He says, on the first day of the week, regarding the collection. Now concerning the collection, on the first day of the week, let there be no collections, essentially when I'm there, but this do on this particular day. So we start to get an understanding of something. The beginning, the, we'll call it the institution, is that basically the celebration of God's creation of what he made. And as you go, we'll say several hundred years pass until it is basically implemented and then spelled out in the law and expounded upon in the later books of the Pentateuch, specifically Numbers and well, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Um, as you leave there, you can kind of separate these. Also want to say one other thing. It's kind of, we tend to not think on the miracle, even something as strange as, I know I'm talking about the law right now, but the miracle is the fact, whether you believe this or not, I, I do actually, I believe it's so wacky, I believe it, that God with his finger wrote on the tables of stone. You know, we don't have anything Anywhere, when people say, well, Jesus never wrote anything except for that one thing he wrote in the sand, which we don't know what he did. Don't say God never wrote anything. I, people say, well, God never wrote anything down. Yes, he did. If he wrote it with his finger, I think he wrote something down. Now, here's where I start to put things in perspective for all of us. You cannot ignore the creation. To do so basically puts you in the current mindset that God is not the creator, that we evolved from some uh, amoeba cell or some uh, amorphous mass or some primordial soup. If you choose to believe that, um, hey, knock yourself out. Uh, I choose to believe that God created, designed. There are no mistakes. What he did, he did with intent, with specific intent, including laying down a set time for rest, which then, of course, should have been rest to appreciate God's creation, but the people couldn't which then morphs into a rest that would remind them of the rest that they have of being delivered from Egypt's bondage. As you progress through the word, you see this will become more and more until you realize you're now into the prophets. So basically you could, you could take the Sabbath and say Sabbath from creation to the Exodus, separate them from David to Nehemiah, and you could observe from, De from David to Nehemiah how we have a degradation and less and more complaints and more murmurings and less celebrating. And from Nehemiah to Christ, as you start to 
kind of get to the close of the Old Testament, you begin now to see it's, it's on a, a level that is unprecedented where almost every prophet, Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah 20, Ezekiel 20, Ezekiel 30, all the chapters 30 in the 40s of Ezekiel all have lament about the people not caring about the things of God, giving lip service, basically flipping God off, okay? So when we get, we have that 400 years of intertestamental period, and people say there was silence, there was not. Much was written during that, during that period, including if one would pick up the book of Maccabees that uh, tells us about the Maccabean rebellion, and Judas Maccabees, in Maccabees you can read extensively about how the Sabbath then, in the book of Maccabees, was by some people, they had great disdain for it, and others, they, they held tightly as it was, in their eyes, the last remnant of what they could truly celebrate without it being essentially taken away from them. So we begin to see a bifurcation of the people, those who will not celebrate, those who become diehard, and then you move into the New Testament. In the New Testament, as I just said, the bulk of the examples are Gospels, Jesus healing, into the book of Acts, Paul going into these places, and then we have silence. So have we solved the problem? Have we answered that nagging question? Well, I can answer the question like this, because I ended last week with this scripture. I'm going to end with it again. It'll make more sense now, I think, having covered everything. If you know where I'm going, good. If you don't, go into Hebrews, book of Hebrews fourth chapter. See, there is a rest remaining. The writer of Hebrews spells it out plainly. Now, you know, this book of Hebrews talks a lot about things like how the old dispensation is done away, how the blood of bull and bulls and goats is no longer in effect because we only needed the shed blood of Jesus Christ or how a lot of these rituals and ceremonies were all made null and void, essentially done away with by Jesus, it is finished at the cross. But here is one thing to kind of take and to graft onto this whole understanding. If the Sabbath represents rest, cessation from your work, right? Then we can say this, we who trust Christ, who faith in Christ are not we are not working in our faith. We don't work the work of works in our faith. We, we faith. The concept of Sabbath rest that begins in Hebrews 4, let us therefore fear lest a promise left being left of us entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it kind of tells you right away, those that heard the gospel, that had the capacity where God opened up their ears, their heart, their eyes, they did not reject, they received. But there are others who they could not, not being mixed with faith. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today after so long a time, as it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts for if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest unto the people of God. Look in your margin, it says a keeping of a Sabbath, but that's not really true, it's of a Sabbath thing. And that Sabbath thing is entering into Christ's finished work. We are no longer, we don't work. You know, there are people within Christendom that they say, well, you know, to be a Christian, you've got to believe in Christ and you've got you to do good works and you've got to work and you've got to do this and you've got to do that. No, you don't. If you want to negate the promise that is given to each person for their simple faith and trust in Christ, 
If you want to negate it, yeah, go back and start keeping the Sabbath. Because here's the premise. To keep the law, you must keep it perfectly and fully, not missing anything, not missing one jot or tittle. But you cannot pull out of the law and say, I'm going to uphold this, because doing that says you, you're basically dragging the whole law back with you. You're not just taking the Sabbath out. You're taking everything. Why? Because Paul says it was nailed. The handwriting of ordinances which was against us, nailed to his cross. So the next time somebody asks you about this question, it's very simple. The Jewish people to this day still celebrate their Sabbath. Their Sabbath is, was, and is still to this day supposed to be a memorial foremost of creation, but now mostly moved, if you read through the, the whole Old Testament, more as a reminder of the redemption and deliverance out of Egypt's bondage, even though in its inception it was not designed for that. And for the Christian, we are resting in Christ, not once a week. This is the error. Because we gather today is not the day where we just say, okay, and it's limited to this day. We are resting in Christ every day. When you are a believer, you're not coming into the tabernacle or into the temple or into the courtyard or into a specific place one day a week. And that, that one day a week appearing in a, in a structure makes you a Christian or makes you a believer. If you believe that, you should get on the next flying saucer. <laughs> you are a Christian wherever you go. There are Christians in far-flung places, in jungles, not having a building to call a church, but wherever they gather and wherever, wherever two or three are gathered in the midst, there he is. We don't need uh, to start resurrecting something that truly Christ came and he said he came to fulfill it and he did. So why would you, it's like that message on forgiveness. Why would you pull the garbage back? And forgive me, I don't mean blasphemy by saying it this way, but why would you pull the garbage back from the curb and take it back in your house? Why would you want to take the law back to yourself when the law was, the curse fell on him. Why do you want to be cursed again? Because that's what the law is called. And don't try and take one part of the law and say, well, well, that, that part there is not law. No, the Decalogue is the Decalogue, and the law is the law. So you either look at the law and understand that this rest that we have, and this is the rest that we have, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. I'm not working my way into the kingdom. I'm fading my way in. I am not trying to do exploits in the name of Jesus. I'm trusting in his name and in the efficacy of what he did. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So it's pretty clear. When I read this like this, it makes sense to me because this whole book is basically explaining to us how much better Christ, how much better is the rest we have in Christ, not limited to a bunch of check, checks and balances that we have to make sure we don't break, we don't violate, but rather if every day is committed to him, then we have a rest in him every day. If every day we are honoring him, and we're not, we're not saying we have one day. See, that's the thing I don't understand. Try this. Uh, let me look over there. I'm going to say with, with Barbara and George, you're a perfect example. Try uh, only seeing each other one day a week. No. That's he's, George is like, no, <laughs> that ain't happening. Try that. And, and that makes, and does that constitute a marriage? One day a week? Is each other, Barbara's laughing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> One day a week, does that constitute a relationship? No, that's what I'm saying to you. So you can't get to it from this corner. So to kind of wrap everything up here and bring everything to a conclusion, uh, which I don't have to take you back into a Sabbath another Sunday, whew, is for those folks in the dispensation of the Old Testament, yeah, it was given as a sign. But for us, the thing is we have, as like the people that came and asking for a sign and what Jesus said, there'll be no other sign but the sign of the resurrection. We have our sign in Christ. We have our rest in Christ. And we don't have one day, we could say we gather and we have church on a Sunday, but for all intents purposes, 
you wouldn't limit it to one day to worship, to pray, to celebrate, to rejoice, to give thanks. You wouldn't limit it. So I don't know why we would. We have a rest every single day in Christ. And this is why, and I close my message with these words. This is why when Jesus said, come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. It goes on to say, take my yoke. And if we understand all that that means, it means that there is no more laboring as the old dispensation. There is no more working to get in. If I could tell people the effort that people try to put into working their way in is negating the grace of God and saying it wasn't enough. When he said it is finished, it means the law was nailed to his cross. He took it with him. And in this dispensation, did Paul say, did Paul anywhere, here's a zealous Jew, did Paul anywhere say, keep the Sabbath, keep keeping the Sabbath? No, he gave instructions. He said about the Lord's Supper, he said basically to keep doing this. There are, there are things that we, we have instructions for, but we don't have an instruction regarding a Saturday Sabbath. And sorry for the Sabbatarians out there, I'm going to say what Paul said now, because really this is the crux of the message. If you celebrate on Saturday, that's your prerogative. I'm saying to you, now that you've been informed, that's your prerogative. Let no man judge you. That's exactly what Paul said in respect of eating, drinking, holiday, new moon, or Sabbath. I just want to put the information out there. You do what you want with it. I'm not here to say that there's one day celebrating over the other that's wrong. If it's being celebrated unto the Lord, quite frankly, especially in this day and age where we have more godless people, I think, than ever, I'll take any day of, of commemorating, celebrating, worshiping, giving thanks, and giving praise. But if you want to know what it is for the Christian, it's not one day. It's every day. Every day we rest. Every day we give thanks. Every day. And no, we don't do it as a mandate. We do it as the scripture says, he first loved me before I even knew him. He first loved me. Is it that hard for me to turn around and say, I can acknowledge him every day because I know what he's done for me. I can acknowledge him every day because I know what he is doing, yet doing for me. And I can acknowledge him every day because I'm going to be with him in eternity. Whatever the time, however time is reckoned in eternity, that's where I will be. And that's where you will be with him. So if you think about it, there is the ultimate Sabbath I just described. But until then, we'll keep faithing and keep trusting the Lord. And hopefully a little bit more clarity has come. For those of you who are kind of wanting to dig more, I encourage you. I constantly encourage you to dig more and do your own studies. But for right now, that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.